founder of Ariana Capital and also who is in the top 30 most powerful women in Europe. So please, a round of applause for Miss Julie Meyer. Good morning. Good morning. I just wanted to uh, actually welcome you to Entrepreneur Country. I'm going to take you through some slides this morning and tell you about Entrepreneur Country. And if the, if the, if the slides are of interest to you, don't hesitate to shoot me an email. My email's on the last slide. I'd be happy to send you the deck. We've also got some questions in about 30 minutes as well. So if any of this resonates with you, we'll have a mic going around the, uh, going around the floor. So Entrepreneur Country is where entrepreneurs go every day. They go to a place where they deal with the reality of what it means to build a business, a startup. And I wrote a book which was published last year called Welcome to Entrepreneur Country. And that's my book. And on the 30th of September, here in London, we're issuing a global invitation for everyone to go to Entrepreneur Country. We're going to be lighting up Entrepreneur Country in cities and regions around the world, about 15 on the 30th of, of September. And we invite you to join us. So if you're interested in going to Entrepreneur Country, please go to entrepreneurcountryforum.com or entrepreneurcountry.com and you'll hear more information about that. I'm going to start with this little guy. I love that face. That is the face of every entrepreneur. They just may not show it to you, but deep down, that's the way they feel inside. And I never forget it. We have about 100 different entrepreneurs who come in to see us at Ariadne Capital every month looking for investment, looking for startup village, looking for um, all of the services and capital and bear hug that we bring to them. But deep inside, this is what they, what they feel. The more you tell them that they can't do something, the more they're going to prove to you that they can. Now I'm gonna give you two reasons why we should care about that little guy. And the first is, is that the entrepreneur, by virtue of his or her background, by virtue of how they grew up or their work experience or their international experience or the chip on their shoulder, they see the future. They have an insight into how the world is going to work. But the second reason is actually more important. Entrepreneurs are people who are willing to live abnormal lives to bring that future to the present. So it's not just that they have a future. A lot of people can see the future. There's a lot of smart people out there and a lot of people who have an insight into the future. But very few people who are willing to actually live an abnormal life to bring that vision to reality. Now, we're coming out of a massive financial crisis. And during that financial crisis, I gave a lot of thought to what it meant to be a capital provider and the role of capital in people's lives. And it seems to me that if we go back in history, and I'm pleased to see around the room today, we've got Michelangelo, Galileo, Leonardo, Gutenberg. We have all sorts of historical references to the innovators, the people who've created the future. That entrepreneurial class of people have always been there. They may not have been called entrepreneurs, they might have been called the artists or the adventurers, the industrialists and so forth. But the entrepreneurs have always been there throughout history. And the role of the capital provider, whether or not that was the Medici family who backed Leonardo or Michelangelo, or Queen Isabella who backed Christopher Columbus to go around the world, the role of the capital provider is to find the entrepreneur of the day. Capital follows ideas, not the other way around. And David Rue of Silver Lake, I remember hearing him, him speak in Cambridge one year where he said, capital is just a heat-seeking missile scanning the globe for the best return. 
So it's important for entrepreneurs and frankly, the entire entrepreneurial ecosystem, not just the entrepreneurs, but everybody who goes to entrepreneur country every day to remember that capital follows ideas, not the other way around. When you're going into an Ariadne Capital, you're going into some venture capital firm, you're there to bring them an idea. You're, you're there to help them help you, not the other way around. Now remember the new economy. Turns out it's only the latest version of new. How many of you have heard of Carlotta Perez? Any Carlotta Perez readers? We've got one over there. Anybody else who's heard of Carlotta Perez? That's the second book for your reading list. After you read my book, then you read Carlotta Perez's book, The Theory of Disruptive Technology and Adoption. Carlotta Perez is a very smart historical economist from Venezuela who was studying oil, as Venezuelan economists do. And she happened to go out to Silicon Valley at the time of the Intel microprocessor, the early 1970s. And what she found amazed her. The Intel microprocessor exploded into the world, this force of disruptive technology in the early 1970s. And she knew something was up. And so she did the hard work of putting it into a historical perspective. And what she found very helpfully by chronicling the past couple 300 years of history from a technological perspective is that roughly the same thing happens every 60 or 70 years. There's a moment of disruptive technology like the Intel microprocessor, and then it beds in over the next 60 to 70 years. And so she's done that, and I put this up to you here, the last five cycles of disruptive change. Now you can see that some of those, the heartbeat, the epicenter was in the United Kingdom. And you can see that it's been in the United States for the last couple. What we've got to make sure is that as the next one comes through, that that disruptive technology which explodes into the world happens in the United Kingdom. Because it's really much easier to get the network effects if you've got the disruptive technology on your own, your own home turf. Okay. Here's what's happened. There's a life cycle to technological revolution. You start with this big bang, and you have this explosion, an installation of new technologies. Carlotta refers to it. And it goes through four different periods. By the end of the fourth period, you have what she refers to, and I love this expression, a new common sense emerges. A new common sense emerges by the end of the 60 to 70 year cycle because it's not technology at that point. The technology has transformed the way people live and work. And that's the important thing to understand, is that technology is no longer an industry. It's a layer. It's a layer which is providing high growth. And so when we see all of what we read in the newspapers and on television and everywhere else we consume information about what's going to drive economic growth? How are we going to get the prosperity that we want for the economy and society? Very rarely do we see the, the discussion about how technology and its mass deployment and implementation penetration into society actually expands the pie. It's one of the main reasons why we live in such a great country. So much benefit has accrued to the United Kingdom and to so many parts of the world because of the force of technological advancement. And that message is nowhere in popular society as much as it needs to be. Until the average waiter at Strada Pizza can quote that back to you, we're not getting that message out. So if you look at the companies that came through in the first and second cycles, you see the big names, and I could have added a whole bunch of other names in that first installation of technology. What Carlotta thinks is that we're going through an extended turning point from the first half of the cycle to the second half of the cycle, because the, at the end of the second period, the money, which is a key, the capital which is following the ideas, gets so 
enamored with making money that it can't find enough of the new stuff and the money makes money on the money, right? And I think we can all kind of look back at the past decade and maybe recognize some of that in society. So the money starts making money out of money and that's when it all starts to fall apart. When, when the capital provider divorces himself from the industrialist, from the entrepreneur, who innately is trying to bring benefit to society and the economy by solving social, economic, business problems and bringing productivity. So Carlotta feels that we're in an extended turning point, but here's the thing. We are also going head, head first into that second half of the cycle, and that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about this morning. So the revolution, and it is a revolution. The revolution starts as a small fact. Not everybody was there in Silicon Valley in 1971. Even those who were there in Silicon Valley didn't know necessarily what was going on. She had her antenna up because she was alive to the, the force of history and economics and so forth. So she started chronicling what was going on and structuring the unstructured data that she saw. But the point is, is that this small fact moves to become a significant force in the market. And how does that new common sense emerge? You've got three factors at play here. The economy, institutions, and technology. You can't deliver a new common sense to the world unless the institutions engage. You can't actually create a new way of living unless actually the established, the status quo is broken down and reformed around the new ways of working, thinking, etc. Now that's Carlotta, but the way that Julie would talk about this is really very simple. I would say when I came to the United Kingdom 15 years ago, and I founded a network of entrepreneurs called First Tuesday. And I was working to help companies like lastminute.com get their funding and go international. It felt like every David, every internet entrepreneur was out there with his or her slingshot. And boy, were they going to assassinate the establishment. David was going to kill Goliath. And that was the kind of running mantra of its day, right? It was a really sexy thing to be an internet entrepreneur in 1999. But there's a really different thing going on today here with Telefonica and O2 behind this event brings it home. Today, David and Goliath must dance. The, the economy and social institutions respond not only to the disruptive technology of the microprocessor and all of the derivative technologies across those 30 years from 1971 to 2001, but they're getting embedded into the establishment. And the winners and the losers are really decided by how well those established companies engage and embrace and integrate the technologies of David. Now the third book for your reading list, you didn't think you were gonna get out of not having work to do on the back of this, I hope. The third book, and it's getting more and more tough because my book is really simple and straightforward. It's a fast 32,000 words. Carlotta's book is good, but it's also starting to get quite academic. But Kurzweil's book, The Singularity is Near, is a must read, but it's a thick book. So I'm giving you the cheat sheet here. And what Kurzweil says is basically, technology operates exponentially. And this is really critical because the world, as we all know, has gone network. It's no longer linear. And this is not a factor of Facebook or LinkedIn, but everywhere you go in any human interaction, it's no longer, I'm selling to you, you're buying to me. We're participating in a transaction. The world is based on ecosystems today. And each transaction is just a micro version of what's happening at the macro level. So if you're still thinking linear in any way, shape, or form, I really encourage you to update your thinking towards network. But Kurzweil talks about how fast the change is happening because when you're dealing with networks and exponential change, at a certain point, you've got to, 
you've, you've, you've literally got to um, start modeling using technology to get ahead of technology because our minds continue to work linearly. And that's the challenge is to create the rules of engagement for humanity and not let technology dictate those rules. Now, I'm kind of into cheat sheets here, so I'm going to share, share with you the biggest cheat sheet we have at Ariadne Capital. We've created the XY axis to explain what we think happens across the industry. We work with our venture fund. We've got a 20 million sterling venture fund. I'm the managing partner, and we back Digital Davids, digital enablers. We're looking to find great people to give 250K for backing their enabling technology and tools business here in the UK. That's why I'm here. I'm looking for those digital enablers. I'm looking for the digital Davids. But I recognize today that if I don't put that digital car on a highway, it's not just the fuel for the tank. It's about giving that car a highway to acquire customers fast. And I guess that's what Telefonica is doing as well. They're giving cars a highway with access to customers through Telefonica. So a lot of entrepreneurs will feel that they need to do a deal with an app store. They're talking to iOS or Android, et cetera. And there is one vision of the future which says that the technology firms, Google, App Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and you can add your list, but that those US technology firms mostly will take over every industry. But that's actually not going to drive an expanding pie. We don't get prosperity by having a couple of big companies in Silicon Valley taking over every industry or being the highway for most of the digital cars around the world. We do if we get the Goliaths to come to entrepreneur country. If we get the, won't, won't say the names, but the boring enterprises, non-technology, they could be the retailers, they could be the banks, et cetera, to come to entrepreneur country and figure out how to open themselves up to be a highway for the digital Davids, that's when it starts to get interesting. That's when we start to really create an expanding pie of prosperity. We can plot every deal that we've done at Ariadne Capital over the past 12 years and every deal that we might do with the companies in our portfolio on this grid. Because in a network world, you start in that lower left-hand corner. You're vulnerable. If you're trying to create movement, being pulled into the market, and you live in a network world, you're trying to get people to do what you want them to do. You need to go from the lower left to the upper right-hand corner where you get the network effects and the lock-in, and that's an incredibly tough thing to do. But I'm going to give you a blueprint for how you do that today. Most of the businesses that we will back and that we have backed provide strategic value. The upper left-hand corner, the, the most that most digital Davids will do is provide strategic value to their better parent, to their highway, to the Goliath with whom they work. And that's pretty good. That's really good, actually. Occasionally, an entrepreneur, a fast-growing business, seizes a market opportunity, is dramatically underestimated by the incumbents, and manages to get across the grid. For example, remember LinkedIn. LinkedIn understood the network orientation to the world. It had a consumer insight that everybody's looking for a job. They're just not necessarily going to hire a recruitment firm, but they will passively present themselves online, updating their profile. Everybody's always looking for the next gig. And they took that consumer insight, the network understanding, and then they were dramatically underestimated by every recruitment firm, every media firm, and so they were able to get from the lower left-hand side to the upper right and to get lock-in into the market to the point when they went public, people said, hang on, how did they get to be worth 9 billion and 90 million of profits and so forth? The, the big, big thing that David has going for him is that Goliath thinks he controls the time frame. 10 years ago, Howard Hartenbaum, 
the first private investor in Skype, sent me an email on the 29th of August, 2003, introducing me to Nicholas Enstrom. He said, this looks really interesting. We've just put some money in. Take a look. Ariadne Capital started working with Skype. We helped them with their early business development, PSTN termination deals. Four of my team flipped into Skype. We were their first advisors in Europe. Two years later, as you know, they were sold to eBay for more than $2 billion. But I remember being on Radio 4 and speaking live to the CEO of BT at the time, won't mention his name. Skype were not a big deal. It was probably November 03. And I remember just when somebody asked me on Radio 4 what the hot new thing was and so forth, I started talking about Skype and the peer-to-peer -peer approach to voice over IP. And the CEO of BT cut me off and he said, that's ridiculous. That'll never work, blah, blah, blah. Scoffing about Skype. Now, you know, that might have been, felt like the right thing to do because nobody had heard about them. But let me tell you, if you wait until everybody has heard about you, if you don't actually try to go early, the underestimation of the entrepreneur is a gift. And so I said to him, I said to the CEO of BT, let me get this straight. Your industry is in a trillion dollar free fall and you've decided to underestimate the entrepreneur who disrupted the music industry with Kazaa. Fantastic. He's happy you're doing that because you are buying him air cover, right? So David feels he has just paranoia on his side. He's got to run like the wind. He doesn't have money in his bank account, but he knows that he controls the time. The time innovation is moving. And the big thing that Goliath has against him is that the CEOs of large companies will say, that innovation thing, that digital thing, we're going to hire that person. We're going to deal with that. I think it's a second half of 2014 issue for us. We might get started in Q2. You don't control the time. And that's the big advantage that David has in this asymmetrical game of warfare between David and Goliath. Now, a company closer to home, I'm sure you've heard of Monetize. Everybody has heard of Monetize here. One of the fastest growing companies in the United Kingdom. The, the flurry of announcements over the past couple of days with their global hookup with IBM, everything that they're doing. If you haven't heard of Monetize, you need to hear of Monetize. Alistair Lukies, the CEO of Monetize, has built a billion dollar market cap business out of London over the past 10 years. And I'm going to tell you more about him in just a moment, but Monetize is a company that has been buying its US competitors, backed by Visa five times, and perfectly exemplifies what I'm going to talk about with these David and Goliath deals, which are, by the way, everywhere. So you can just see a smattering of David and Goliath deals, but let me tell you, over the next decade, you're going to see big and small David and Goliath dance. And it's going to be David who understands the business model, who understands the time frame, who's going to unlock the value in Goliath. So Mark Andreessen said it as well. His version of Carlotta Perez is software is eating the world. Nine-tenths of the world has not been remade by digital business models. It's not gone software. It's not driven by consumer data, but it will. That second half of Carlotta's 60-year cycle is all about the world being eaten by software. If you use software as a metaphor for the technologies being integrated into Goliath. So given all that, what's the investment opportunity if you're running a fund, if you're working in the market with entrepreneurs? As you might imagine, we have a cunning plan. We never forget for a moment that innovation is about economics. It's not about technology. If it were, we'd all be flying the, jet, we'd all be flying the Concorde. We're not. We're stuffed into jumbo jets. That makes the case right there. And as I've said to you before, the fundamental network orientation to business changes everything. Because the digital enablers, the digital Davids, they understand 
that there is this multi-stakeholder base to every transaction. I mean, Apple understood it as well. The innovation that Jobs and his team brought to the market was not, not so much about the product. It's that he broke the stranglehold on the consumer in the mobile telecoms industry. He busted open the cartel and said, I'm going to recognize in the music world with the, with the iPod, the consumer, the artist, these different parties, the multiple stakeholders in the transaction, and then he did it again with the iPhone and mobile telecoms. Business model, the economics of the industries that he went after was really what Apple, Apple did in terms of structuring the economics for the ecosystem. We refer to this as ecosystem economics, and, and that is the pair of glasses that we use at Ariadne Capital, an entrepreneur country, to understand who will win, who has won, and why. And whether you're a David or a Goliath, there's really only two questions that you have to ask yourself as you're building your business, going to market, etc. Who are my natural allies? Everybody has natural allies. Some people just don't stop to do the exercise of saying, who are my natural allies? I believe this, I'm trying to get there. Who else believes this? Who else is trying to get there? And half the reason why people don't stop to think is because they sometimes don't like their natural allies. Sometimes these are companies that aren't sexy. They need a new story, but they have an asset base or they're an installed base or, or something, and they are the natural ally. And the second question you need to ask yourself is, how do I make it in their interest to pull me into the market? How do I make it in my natural ally's interest to pull me into the market? Because in a network world, it's not a function of how smart you are. It's not a function of how hard you work. It's a question of, can you align the economics for your natural allies to pull you in towards that market position that you've identified as the center of your ecosystem. I'm going to give you a couple of stories. Google, let's talk about them for just a moment. They say they, they organize the world's information. They actually do a lot more than that, don't they? They organize the economics of the world's information. And I and you, as a user of their free search, get no economic upside to the fact that our data is being used to drive the valuation of hundred, couple hundred billion market cap company. So we know that our data has a value because it is part of the transaction which is central to Google. And we get no economic upside for that. So we're part of the transaction, but we're not being compensated for our role. And I long thought that it would be the Achilles heel of Google if another entrepreneur with a hell of a lot of chutzpah came along and organized a different set of economics for that transaction. And I found that entrepreneur. His name is John Paleomolites. He ran a British business called Beat That Quote. Beat That Quote was a price comparison engine. It was a consumer services, financial services business. And what John was doing was giving a cash back for the use of people's data in the transaction. And because he did that knowingly, didn't do it by accident, he understood what he was doing. He was compensating people for the use of their data. And because he was clear about why he was doing it, and he argued it as an economic model which had to succeed because he understood the ecosystem economics implicitly, John came to the attention of Google who gave him a call and said, we'd like to buy you. And as a result of those negotiations, which Ariadne helped him with, a company with 250,000 pounds of EBITDA, not a lot, was sold for 40 million sterling. Now, why would a business be sold for 122 times EBITDA multiple unless it fundamentally attacked something of interest to Google? So this is an example on the upper left-hand side of the strategic value. This is when it gets interesting, is when you can really articulate what you're doing as a digital David and the impact that you have on that Goliath distribution 
model. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit more about monetize for those of you, unbelievably, who don't know about them in the market. Alistair Lukey said something very simple at the beginning of his tenure journey, and the greatest insights are simple insights. They're not the you know mathematical algorithms. They are. Alistair said, if this mobile banking, if this is going to work, it has to work for everybody. So he was already thinking about the mobile operator, the bank, and lowering the cost of capital for the individual, compared to say Western Union, who will charge you 22% if you're poor to transfer money. He said, "I'm going to come up with the rationale and the economics and the incentive for each of the now each of the parties in the transaction, each of my natural allies, and creating a mobile money ecosystem." He understood where he wanted to go. He identified his natural allies. He created the incentives to make them work with him to get pulled into the market, and he has been pulled into the market. He services a thousand financial institutions today. As I said earlier, he has bought his U.S. competitor. He's been backed by Visa five times at a premium to what they could have purchased his shares on the open market. Ariadne worked with him early on and helped him create many of the elements of his success over the eight years that we worked with him. Another company that should be on your radar screen if you haven't heard of them already is Matternet. Matternet is going to help companies go aerial. There will come a time where you will receive those net-a-porter packages. With little drones landing in little ground stations, not just by a delivery truck, Matternet are actually organizing a set of economics to deliver small packages, medical supplies, e-commerce packages around the world. If you haven't been following the drone or UAV phenomena in the market, we're in the early days of a massive new ecosystem which is emerging. The big players. Like TNT and the rest of them are starting to wake up. They recognize that new digital business models are happening. The digital entrepreneurs are afoot. The entrepreneurs are starting to live abnormal lives, and that this industry will take off and grow over the next decade. Sound out, David Curtia Dutton's business, a company who started off as a fan financing engine, didn't work that well. But David persisted, and he kept on building up a database of music. Turns out that we might like different kinds of music, but we would agree on what's good music. And so, what he's created is a way to predict what good music is by using the crowd. Interestingly, he identified the wrong natural ally. He said, "It's in the interest of the record label to work with me." But the record labels were not interested. They fell in that same category of CEO of BT who said, "Poof, ain't gonna happen. We control the time frame. Remember, we're big. You're small." So David quickly went to an alternative, natural ally, the ra the radio station, and said, "Hey, you're kind of tired of being given the list to play from those record labels. Why don't I help you break new artists?" And so that's what he did. He identified the radio stations that everybody had forgotten about, and gave them the tools, the digital tools, to break new artists, which of course had the effect of waking up the record labels. Now he's working with the radio stations, he's working with the record labels, and he is a very fast-moving David that is becoming not just a digital David with strategic value, but he's moving across that grid to high financial value, leveraging the Goliath distribution that he's done. One of our latest investments out of the Ariadne Fund is Quill. Quill is a platform. The entrepreneur is Ed Bussey. He was the guy behind Zib, which was sold to Vodafone. He was the guy behind Fig Leaves, which was sold to N Brown. Quill has understood something very simple about the new modern media company. It's not going to have journalists. They're going to outsource the journalists because it turns out there's a whole lot of people around the world who can create content. But what Quill's doing, which is very clever, 
and this is another important element of ecosystem economics, is that those who structure the unstructured data, those who think about how the industry should work, who provide the infrastructure for not just their own business, but for the industry, which enable the industry to be more profitable. We call those the cartographers, and the cartographers always win. The people who structure the industry, as Ed Bussey is doing with Quill, are in a massively preferential position to clean up. And finally, Tagstar. Tagstar is run by Fraser Robinson, who was the media sales guy for Brent Hoberman at lastminute.com. Tagstar is making images searchable. The entire industry which is searchable for content has yet to happen with images. Tagstar is creating the economics for how all of its natural allies, publishers, retailers, etc., can make money out of creating standardized, structuredized, monetizable assets called images. So what we understand in our role as a structure of the industry of the financing of entrepreneurship is that there's five phases. The first phase is the, pro is the idea stage. And a lot of people have ideas for businesses. I call this the Saturday night dinner party stage. Because on Saturday nights, everybody has an idea. And they tell you over the glass of wine what they would do if they were going to set up a business. I've got an idea, and I might do this. And 99% of the population never do anything. But 1% of the population get it together and build a product. A product is taking that consumer insight that you have and actually creating a product. And then you got to go to market. Very few financiers of entrepreneurship want to get involved when it's just a product. They really want to see some money. Are people buying what you're selling? But I say, actually, it's better to go early. It's better to be an early believer. Don't just wait until the early adopters have done their job. Get in front of the queue and be an early believer. It's kind of like raising children. If you raise them well, then when they get older, they got it all sorted out and they got their best chance. If you kind of wait until they get to be 12 years old, they could have made all sorts of crazy mistakes. Same thing with startups. If you, let, if you don't create a positive architecture for the startup early, keep them from doing the silly things that people can do when they don't understand all the mistakes that they can make, like having eight co-founders, giving away founders' equity to everybody because they did two days of work. There's all sorts of mistakes. And by going early, we can create that positive architecture for startups and help them go to market more effectively. So phase three is about that business model. And that's where we're looking for entrepreneurs who understand the essence of ecosystem economics. And we typically don't have to teach them that. They typically intuitively understand it, but we help them guide it through. Because by phase four, if you don't have the solid foundation, the positive architecture, an understanding of how you're going to go to market, and you are actually hurtling through the atmosphere in rapid growth mode, believe me, the wheels are going to come off your rocket if you haven't done it correctly. And phase five is cash flow positive. It's you've, you've become the new Goliath. You've scaled and created, you're in your orbit in the new ecosystem. So in 2013, network benefits accrue to those firms who understand their role in their ecosystem and organize the economics for it. This in turn leads to exceptional returns for their shareholder. It's really very simple. Follow the entrepreneur. He or she has the market insight. He or she is the creator of value. He or she is the hero. So there you go. There's the email if you want a copy of the slides. You are invited to come to Entrepreneur Country. We are going global on the 30th of September. You are invited to come to the Royal Institute of Great Britain on the 30th of September for our global launch. If you have a business that we should be backing because you've been nodding your head as I've been talking, you say, that's me, that's me, I'm the next David, please send us a business plan. Thank you very much, and if you have any questions, I'd be delighted to try to answer them. Thank you. <coughs>
I think we have a microphone going around here somewhere. Anyone? Right here in the front row. And please tell me who you are. Thanks. Uh, hi, Julie. That was great. So I'm Phil McCauley. I'm a serial investor and entrepreneur. And uh, I wanted to ask you about the impact of crowdfunding mm -hmm. on your market and how you see that developing, because it seems to me that that's quite disruptive. Good question. Phil McCauley? Phil McCauley is an uh, entrepreneur and investor is asking about the impact of crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is transforming the financing of entrepreneurship. So we're embracing it. We're not going to be even at our relatively small size of Goliath here. Uh-uh-uh. No, no, no. We're embracing the change. So if you go to Entrepreneur Country under finance, you'll see we're helping companies create other distribution to find additional investors and we're getting companies funded using Crowdcube on Entrepreneur Country, right? Because they're going to get not just the doctors and the dentists, they're going to get everybody from Cornwall to Newcastle and aggregate those private investors. And that you're right, it's absolutely not going to, it's changing the financing of entrepreneurship. And let's face it, there's a lot of money in the United Kingdom and our goal is to get that money, the capital, following the ideas and so forth. So we're absolutely embracing it. I still obviously feel that there's a role to get the big money to back venture funds and so forth. So part of what I do is to try to break down that institutional fortress of money. The guys that are writing the 100 million pound checks, the asset allocators, and to say, this is what's going on. You're going to catch the next Spotify or Shazam or whatever. It's better to do that as they're growing, as they're going through th phase three and four. Don't just wait until they go public on NASDAQ or London Stock Exchange and deal with them as a public listed company. But it's always better to be part of the journey. So we're, we're, we're engaging at all levels, but we're absolutely with you that the financing of entrepreneurship is a, is a changing uh, landscape. Good question. Thank you. Please, lady right here in the front row. Well, she needs a microphone. You could shout, but she's got one coming. Hello. Uh, my name is Jemima Wartho. I'm a digital project manager for Maverick Television. Um, my query really is to do with health and the future of health applications and digital health. What do you think health providers could learn from current digital innovation in more commercial sectors? Hmm. Fabulous, Jemima. I love the question because healthcare is my family's business and I'm particularly interested. Health is one of the big digital ecosystems that Ariadne Capital and Entrepreneur Country is, is operating in. Um, it's not one of our, the, the biggest, but where most of the benefits, I think it's one of, if we can unlock health using digital enablers, we can create a lot of value for people. And you do, if you listen to the news, hear some good signs about how the NHS is trying to do that. But I think the, to answer your question, because Jemima is asking about how health can learn from other sectors. And I love the way you asked the question because I think we can learn so much from other sectors. I think you need the horizontal pair of glasses. You can, it's not about going, it is about going deep, but it's also about going horizontal. So what we learn from financial services or media or retail is very applicable to health. And those are going back to the David and Goliath side it's about the network. It's about the multiple stakeholder transactions. It's about consumer data. It's about the ecosystem economics. And ultimately, the NHS is a big highway. It should be providing customers to make it easier for the new digital Davids coming through to acquire customers. You've got great companies in healthcare like Patients Know Best in Cambridge providing electronic health records. You've got thousands of them. The NHS and every Goliath will be transformed by the local entrepreneurs, or not, as the case may be. But the case studies and the way that monetized, tackled, and created a new industry, mobile banking, bringing a cut of the digital revenues to the banks, who otherwise would not have received those. Those digital revenues, the mobile money revenues, would have gone to PayPal or to Western Union. That's what British entrepreneurs any entrepreneurs in Britain, bringing digital healthcare applications to the NHS, to the large companies like Bupa, any of those other healthcare providers, they're helping them get a cut of digital revenues that they wouldn't otherwise get. Good question. Thank you. Any other questions or thoughts? 
Gentleman right here. Hi, um, I'm Simon McCann from Launch48. Um, I've got a question about business models. So at the minute, we're seeing a rise in startups that are trying to make education more accessible to everybody. So kind of the massive open online courses. At the same time, we're seeing ad funded businesses suffer. There's a lot of competition for ad space. There seems to be a conflict in between companies that are trying to make something open and the business model that can fuel them. What's your opinion on business models, particularly kind of ad-funded business models? Yeah, so si it was Simon, right? Yeah. Simon at Launch48, which is a fantastic uh, accelerator. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that you say that, because when I was writing my book, there were a couple of jumping off points where I started to really link things up over the past couple of years. And the ad business model always confused me, because for whatever reason, we were not working with any companies with advertising business models. And I thought, what are we doing wrong, right? What, what is it that we're not getting and so forth? Until I realized that the advertising business model is just the same business model as every business model. It's a transaction business model. And the more I unpicked the different parties, the more I understood what Google was doing and why they were winning. It helped me come to my thesis about ecosystem economics. And so really, you've got to decouple. I think the, the, the sooner we don't even think about it as an advertising business model, but just go down to fundamentals about who are the players and how do we, how do we in any market, again, what I, what I mentioned just a moment ago, is if the advertiser, if the media company is one of the participants in that transaction, fair enough. But typically, and that's, that, that has been why the industry has been set up, Google has been taking the predominant amount of the economics, right? And they don't recognize or incentivize all of the players there. I think business model is the most important thing you've got to get right in going to market. There's some fantastic people, products, et cetera, market opportunities. Um, but they don't always um, unlock the business model. I'm happy to have a, another conversation about it, but that's probably the most that I can say on that, except that I don't think advertising is a unique model. I just think it's another transactional model. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? I'm supposed to be off stage and right about now. One last question. Okay. I think that's, think that's it. Thanks very much.